Are you this on the stretch? Hi. Challenges. Challenge you. Yeah. Okay. Well. <laughs> Hi, as everyone, as Grant says, uh, my name is Oren Shaw. Um, as you may know, I am a local DevOps expert. Um, I deeply focus on tech culture. And you may have previously heard me speak on the subject of tech culture. And you may have also found me participating in the third, large, third longest running internet argument, also known as Twitter. By day, I am founder and DevOps culturalist at IR Limited. We are, as I mentioned, a DevOps consultancy here in Wellington. And the core thing that we work on is ensuring the success of technological change by focusing on the cultural and organizational dynamics that impede technological change. And then initially I gave this talk in, at serverless days in Auckland. And while this isn't about serverless days, as a concept, serverless is a good proxy. A lot of the work I do nowadays is, as a DevOps is with serverless functions on AWS Lambda. And as a result, this whole serverless thing, I, this is cool. I'm on board with it. I love that I get to, well, you know, for free. I get a thing where all of the infrastructure is just taken care of. IO is handled, API access is handled, everything's just handled. And as I write Python, I can just use whiskey wrappers and be done. I'm gonna keep smacking that, that's not good. It's really easy and I really love this. This is power and abstraction at a level that we never really had before, where all I have to care about is running code. Nothing else is there. This is the promise of a new and interesting future. And it comes with some constraints, like I need to think about my system in decomposed pieces, lots of little parts communicating together. And it takes that microservices model, which you may have heard of before, and it, it really, really forces you into that worldview. It forces that really decom decomposed mindset. It forces us into thinking about our APIs and our boundaries. It forces us to think about interface stability we're cooking in someone else's kitchen. So all of these decisions, this technology, makes them for us. The patterns that we use, well, they're already set. They're done, they're dealt with. We can move on. And this is great, like I love this, I really love this. And if you come up, after me, come up to me afterwards and ask, I will gush on about lambdas forever, for hours. However, and there's always a however, and however is, as always, very important. And however is that, like with any new technology that we're excited about, we're on board with it. We're interested. We're present. We're showing up. We attend the conferences. We participate in the communities. We believe. We carry that belief back because we're in the know. And you know, even if we haven't managed to get new technologies that we like and that we're interested in into production ourselves. Anything we're, that's new and we're interested in, we think it's a viable future. But I must always ask at this point, what about the people who aren't there with you? What about your teammates who scoff this idea of this fancy new technology? It's serverless in my case. What about them? What about your boss or your boss's boss who says, no, we're, we're not going to use this new tool. Or the sysadmin teams who say, nah. Or project management that says we can't plan for that. Or the architects who don't know how to design around that. Or QA who doesn't know how to test it. Or support. And this, with every new technology, is where I start hearing grumbling and irritation. Because how often are any of those people actually on board? How often are they willing to listen to our excitement and our, our joy, listen to these new ideas? These ideas that we know are good ideas. We think, we know that these new technologies have legs. They will go places. They are the future. So why won't they get on board? Why aren't they listening? Why are they saying no? Why are they resisting what is clearly a good technology choice? You can all hear me okay, right? I'm coming there? Yep. Well, and I'm, I'm glad you asked. And the reason is, naturally, the title of my talk. The new ideas, new technologies, the ideas of them are not enough. They won't be enough. They can not. 
be enough. <laughs> but Oren, you might exclaim, why? What do you mean? This thing I like, these new things, they are good technologies. And good technologies, they should always win. Right? Well, <laughs> I'm about the visual puns. You might, you might enjoy this. <laughs> No, visual puns, I mean, they're best. They work really well. Um, to answer that question, I need to cover actually some underlying assumptions on the nature of technology and the nature of change, the nature of our organizations in relation to these things. And in doing so, we can answer the question of why being good can never be enough, why technology alone cannot save us. And to start, we ask, well, what is technology? And naturally, technology has a very straightforward answer as to what it is, right? Well, it turns out that yes, actually, it does. Technology, at its most fundamental, is a force amplifier. It improves our ability to reach a goal. It makes it easier for us to achieve tasks. That's it. That is all technology is. And this stretches back from the very first technology that we invented, which was fire, by the way, and which naturally amplified our ability to extract nutrition from food. Or another early technology, the bow and arrow, which improved our ability to throw sharp sticks at potential food. Or agriculture, which kicked off our ability to build civilization, to build cities, to centralize. It amplified our ability to have food safety. And this technology naturally led to you being here listening to me. Technology is interesting because it affects everything that we make, everything that we do, every technology that we build exists for one purpose, to improve someone's ability to achieve a goal. But technology is more than that. It's a force amplifier, but it's not neutral. It exists, but it doesn't just exist. It exists to serve a purpose. And so when I say that it's not neutral, that lack of neutrality is best expressed by, um, well, you've, you've probably heard the phrase, all technology is political, coming up a lot more often lately. And that's what I'm getting at with neutrality. All technology is political. Uh-oh. No. <laughs> the fridge. And that is what I'm getting at with neutrality. All technology is political. But the word political is overloaded, and I'm not meaning the left-wing versus right-wing framing. Instead, I'm talking about of people. Technology is of people. Excuse me. And being of people, well, we have assumptions. We have worldviews and outlooks, and we exist within social structures. And we make choices based on those social structures. And because technologies exist solely to amplify force, technologies must carry the force, must carry the politics of which force should be amplified. So every technology carries within itself its assumptions, its own framework. Let's explore what I mean by that. Let's talk about writing. Literacy as a whole. And we think of this as unequivocally good. It lets us distribute and persist ideas at a scale we never could before. It means we are no longer bound by the slow and sometimes glossy systems of oral tradition. And that's the assumption. That's the politics. That we should break from oral traditions. That it's better to disseminate ideas as far and as fast as we can. It carries questions, too, like, is this worth writing down? And this got asked a lot about oral traditions back when writing book, uh, making books and printing books was really expensive. So we made lots of value judgments around what should be recorded, what is worth recording. And those politics, those assumptions, create what literacy means today. Politics and assumptions even create the alphabet that we use. This letter is thorn. It used to be a part of English. It got dropped because it was inconvenient. 
So what would happen was printers would buy movable type, but often they were finding themselves importing from Germany or Italy, from languages that don't have the thorn. So they would end up replacing it with the capital Y, or eventually TH, as you know today. What about roads? Again, we th the assumption is that it should be easy to get around, easy to move goods around, easy to move armies around. And this, as a side effect, contributed again to making our civilization what it is. It made it, again, easier to centralize. And today, it enables just in time to, it enables modern just in time logistics. For a lot of you, if you drove here, it made it possible for you to get here to see me. But the roads themselves have politics. What should we connect to the roads? How good should that road be? Does your town get highways or paved roads? Or just a gravel track? And the politics of these choices re reflect our broader context. Good roads belong near important shipping points, ports, for instance. Think about another technology. How about steam power, the politics of steam? that we should amplify the forces of laborers far beyond what a human can do, that it should be possible for a human to make or to work faster than they ever could before. And this led directly to factories, to the Industrial Revolution. And it had political ramifications. We're all familiar with the idea of Luddites, the Luddite movement, and they objected politically to these ideas. But more to the idea that this was a good thing, And I've picked these examples because they're far enough away that the arguments for and against are, they're no longer emotional. We, they, because the arguments are over. We've picked this path. We are living with these consequences. The distance can make it a bit hard to see the associated politics, though, largely because we've internalized them. They're the status quo. It's what we've accepted. So how about a more recent technology? That's a really good recent technology. How about the internet? What assumptions does the internet carry? Now, the history of the internet is, um, begins in 19, the 1960s with ARPANET, which was the project to ensure that communication could persist in, well, the event of the Cold War ending extremely badly for everyone involved. <laughs> everyone in general. Um, so the core assumption of the internet was enabling and maintaining communication in the face of catastrophic damage, any damage. And as the internet grew, enabling communication stretched across the globe. Unfortunately, this globe, if you notice, does not really have a New Zealand, yet another one of those maps. Um, and it turned into anyone, anywhere, but always still can, retaining that core designed to work around damage, which gives us a design that carries the idea of freedom of communication, ensuring that communication is extremely difficult to suppress. This means the internet carries the freedom of speech. Because the internet treats communication breaks as damage, it will route around them. It's a great quote. Um, you may have also heard this called the Streisand effect. Which, and if you're not familiar with that effect, um, the Streisand effect is famous actress Barbara Streisand attempted to have aerial photography of her house that had been posted to the internet suppressed. And the internet responded by saying, information wants to be free. Take this and pass it on. This also happened with DCSS, if uh, you remember that. Um, there's lots of examples. There's numerous examples of this. But the underlying assumption, the underlying politics on all of them is that communication sh must not be suppressed. Communication should be free. The underlying assumption of free speech, that's invisible because we've internalized the ideas. Freedom of speech is largely a given in New Zealand. It's normal. But the idea of you should have free speech gets brought with it, but gets brought along when you connect to the internet. It is intrinsically linked to the idea of the internet. It's inescapable. And we do recognize this effect, this idea of technology being driven by politics. We have a name for it. Necessity is the mother of invention. 
what we need, we make. We have a wonderful talk from just earlier this evening on the same subject. But my needs aren't yours. Yours aren't mine. And the things that I make will have different assumptions built in, different takes on what need means. And I've seen this effect several times over now. Uh, Ruby on Rails, when that came out, this was an ex exemplary example of this viewpoint. The needs were not met. It made assumptions. It came from a new... It's also sh which is showing us how technology embeds its politics. We have a name for that as well, Conway's Law, which, again, if you haven't heard of it, says that organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of those organizations. Now, tell me, is any technology that we make not a system? The products of our organizations are systems, and they carry our politics. My solution will have different beliefs baked in to the very idea of that technology. Ruby on Rails, I really want to come back to this, capture that idea so well. They spoke about omakaze, omakaze and opinionated software, convention over configuration. This is politics. These are political statements. And to use Rails, you must internalize these politics. And it's not good or bad. It just is. It's important. But why is it important? Well, to answer that, we need to talk about organizations and context. Uh, so what is context? Well, our context is the social structure all around us. In our organizations, this would be our culture. And our culture is our culture. Yes, this is a tautology. What is, is. It's the result of all of the choices that we made and didn't make and didn't know that we were making makes it a social system that dictates what is and is not possible, what is and is not acceptable. And I bring this up because, well, I actually want to talk about black swans for a moment. Bear with me, it makes sense. Um, but those of, those of you who haven't heard of a black swan event, well, to use the specifically canonical example of surprise of only ever having seen white swans, and very reasonably assuming that only white swans exist, until all of a sudden, you arrive in Western Australia and surprise, black swans. And I bring up this idea, this black swan event, as the dramatic reevaluation, the huge context shift. All of a sudden, in one moment, our taxonomy of swan changed. Our category theory of swan changed. The idea of phylogenetics happened. What else, when these things happen, needs to be reevaluated? What else is false. And we look at technologies in the same light. We can call them anything we like. I like calling them black swan technologies. In the 1960s, when we invented the internet, no one could foresee what it would become today. That it would completely and fundamentally rewrite so much of our culture and society. Just these. These things alone. And black swan events, if you look it up on Wikipedia, they speak of its inevitability that we could look back and say, oh yeah, that certainly would have happened. And the benefit of hindsight in that regard is for some things, but it's not what I'm getting at. What I really want to get at here is that the other way, is, sorry, is the other way of looking at black swan events, specifically the out of context problem. And I prefer this frame because it captures what I'm driving towards. If we take something monumental, like the cloud, the cloud is a great example of this. It's been 12 years since the cloud happened. 12 years and, I used to know the math for this, it was like four months. 12 years and four months. And there are still companies to this day who have not moved to the cloud, who cannot use the cloud, who do not use it. Because it's outside their context. Because it does not make sense. Because it was and is an out-of-context solution. And this is a reversal of the idea of a black swan event. It is the reverse of Conway's law. And the inverse of Conway's law, that would be, well, if Conway's law is telling us that organizations produce copies 
of its communication structures, then the inverse, if we take Rails, must be that using a technology means we must accept the politics and assumptions of that new technology, which, as we touched on earlier, means we think we should have roads, that we should be able to read, that our travel should not just be possible, but easy, that the words that we have written down, you and I, have worth and meaning and value and should be easily propagated, that we should have ubiquitous access to the vastness of recorded knowledge, to cheap and easy communication with our friends and our loved ones. But it also patients already know how to communicate. They already have solutions to their problems because they already know what solutions look like. They know what they're permitted to look like. So when we talk about new, new technologies, they are new solutions. They're 100% new to solutions to problems that you have. Every time you talk about this, you have a problem, it solves it. But for organizations, existing organizations, it doesn't look like a solution because it doesn't make sense. Because for an organization with existing structures, existing communication, existing process, the questions are, why would I want this? How would I monitor it with my existing tools? How would I integrate it with my existing process? How would I make it fit with what I have? And these are not technical demands. These are cultural demands, the cultural system, that specific set of controls that drives what choices you're permitted to make. And so when we look at new technologies in these terms, it struggles to make sense because it violates those existing contexts. It opposes the cultures that we have built at our organizations. And this will naturally create friction, frustration. It creates that question that we're, we love to ask, why won't they just change? And the answer is, naturally, that they can't. And they can't because the default culture that gets built is one that is built to resist, is built to prevent change. Let's unpack what I mean when I say that. Cultures exist within a context, and that context is built upon all of our past choices, processes that have been built up over time. And processes and policy are choices that were made, choices made so they don't have to be made again, where we've thought about a problem and we've solved it. We, we're done now. We know what size widgets to buy. They're, these ones are that big. That's all we need. And that's. That's the generator of stasis. Not only have we made this choice and written down what we chose, but we tell each other what the choice was. We tell newcomers what the choice was. The newcomers will tell newer comers what the choice was. And new choices will be made on new choices made leading back to that first initial choice. A choice, time, and a place with surrounding rules and goals and desires that are different than what they are today. And these processes and policies, these choices from the past, they create these walls and boundaries, not by telling us what we can or cannot do, but by telling us how we will be measured and judged and if we will be found wanting. So resistance to change is never built on fear of change, but on fear of being seen as incompetent or unable to meet goals and objectives, of existing in a culture and understanding that culture, knowing what choices were made and why, they were, and why they were made and how best to make new choices, and then being cast into the uncertainty of a new system with new rules and new goals and new outcomes and desires. And this is a system. This is a social system with social constraints and social outcomes. And these social systems, not technical choices or false ideas of technical merit, these social systems dictate what our choices can be. And this is the point where you're probably saying something like, Orin, this is terrible, this is bad, this is so limiting, we need to throw all of this away, we need to start over. And cool, I'm glad you brought that up. I'll just speak for you, it's fine, right? Um, because there's actually two more things there I want to talk about. Two things that derive from this goal, this, this drive to reset. 
And the first idea is that once you have a process, you can't unhave it. It's there forever. Because it influences every choice that comes thereafter. It becomes your context. And it cannot stop being your context. Every choice made thereafter is influenced by the presence of that process. And even the choice to remove that process is itself bound by the existence of the initial process. Its legacy will remain in every choice made thereafter. New, uh, excuse me, new choices define themselves as being not the process that was. I want to come back to Rails on this. Rails defines itself as a reaction to Java, the ways in which Java programs were designed and implemented and built. This isn't the only example. Another really good one would be Unix. Unix is defined as not multics. It is defined as what can, is not. The other thing I wanted to mention here is a lot harder to hear. The second thing is a much, much more challenging idea. And the idea is that if you are, if you think this state of affairs is bad, if you are frustrated by it, if you want your organizations to change, well, that you are frustrated by this is, um, there's no easy way to say this, but that's irrelevant. Your opinions on the processes and context of your organizations do not matter. And that's hard to hear, because we are taught to think that what we think is important, that our opinions have weight and meaning value. But the process is still the process. The context is still the context. What is, is. And it exists. And it exists regardless of our desires to the contrary. It exists because all of us are forced to participate in it. Because it is bigger than any one of us. Because it judges our performance, the performance of others. It judges whether we belong. But that's okay, because we know how it works. We can plan around it. It's normal. It's the status quo. And maintaining normality gives us safety. It requires that we be static, to consider changes abnormal, to do things wrong. Which means, as a whole, we are unable to adapt to new technologies, because they require changing the status quo. They require adopting new politics, new processes, new policies. And when we're looking at out-of-context solutions, the new tools that we think are interesting, that we think are good, we're looking at black swans, at concepts outside of our context, a concept that is not technically good or bad, as objectively, as objectively technically good does not exist, but these things merely have incompatible politics. And our context does not care if we disagree. Our context still exists. What is, is. And this itself is just an outcome. It is not good or bad. It merely exists. It is a tautology itself. What is, is. And you know, this is kind of a bit heavy after some really nice pizza. But I, I am bringing it up for a reason. And the reason is that these ideas, I think, are fundamental. And as hard as they are to hear, I'm bringing them up because they tell us so, so much. They show us how to look at our organizations, our bosses, our teammates, give us the frame of mind to look and see why they're not on board. What pressures and forces are keeping them from change? Let's just look at ourselves. Ask why we are on board. What permits us to be? What it means for what we do? that we're on board because we've adopted these politics, that we could adopt these politics, that we can think that these are good ideas, worthwhile solutions, excuse me, even that they're allowed to be potential solutions. It gives us a framework, a way of looking at the world that lets us answer, why are they saying no? What prevents them? What are their needs? And how are their needs not being met? So what does this all let us do? It tells us how to think, how to think about the nature of what we're asking. Because we're not asking for people to think what we're doing is OK or exciting or interesting. We're asking them to change their politics, to change the ways that they decide on what is and is not acceptable or possible. And as we 
touched on, change isn't scary. This isn't change is scary. This is a threat to my competence, a threat to my ability to feel competent, a threat to my ability to project competence, to be of value to the organization. That is a change of context. These are out of context solutions. And we need to understand that as much as you and I do, they exist in this organization that does not notice their opinions and imposes constraints built on its own past. This framework also, also asks us, or also shows us how to think about change. That change is a function of context, that change must, change must exist within the needs and goals of the organization around it. it tells us how to initiate change. It's actually very, very straightforward, but never easy. Because finding their context is the first step, and it is the most, the most overlooked part. What we think is important is not. Anything in any new technology, we must find what their concerns are, what they do right now that this thing that we like can make better. And more than just better, more than just tell them, we need to show them. Show them how we can help them meet their goals, meet their needs, to do better in the system that binds them. A friend told me a story once about trying to get Docker and CI/CD into their dev pipeline at work. And this is a large state institution. They're very stable, very um, six month long change management cycles. Um, and they had naturally a very firm change management process to go with that. And Docker and CI/CD, if you've ever worked with them, you know that these are politically extremely incompatible with pre-existing change management processes. It's very different. And this incompatibility was reflected in attempts to use it. And it was exemplified by the person in charge of change management. They were pushing back hard. Their context prevented them from even examining these as technical changes. The system had demands that they had to meet first. So the team trying to get CICD and Docker in, they, they listened to these concerns. They went out and they listened. And they took them on board and they built a demo. And they said, this is how we build artifacts. This is what goes into them. This is what you get out of this process. Does this meet your needs? And it did. The, the change management manager uh, got more out of this new and improved process than they ever did in previous processes. It enabled, the, it improved their ability to do their job. It's a force amplifier. And this is important to consider. Because as I've been saying for a while, your context, your goals, are not relevant to them or their goals. You kind of don't matter. So we have to make ourselves matter. And that's a framing shift, where we suddenly have to start thinking about ourselves as part of a larger whole, part of other people's goals, how we enable those goals for them, how our technology amplifies for them, not for ourselves. So you need to go and find out what their context is. You need to listen and not argue. <laughs> no, really, one of the biggest mistakes that we keep making is, and especially when we're passionate about something, we have new and cool technology that we want to show off, we try to argue our points. Argue how their goals are misguided or incorrect or pick something. And we do this all the time. I used to do this. And this is also a huge, long conversation in contempt culture that we can have later if you would like. But I really want to focus on this because arguing about it devalues their needs. It tells them that we don't think they're relevant. It tells them to ignore us. And actually, that entire thing is the DevOps mentality. It is the dismantling of silos. It is treating other skills with respect and admiration, listening to the context and needs of other users, other people. And all of this is why I say that technology cannot save us. By talking about technology as only technologies, we're ignoring things that make DevOps special. We're ignoring the ways that DevOps lets us think about it, how we relate to others, how our skills amplify theirs, how their skills amplify ours. It, we ignore the ways that we can build new cultures the way it lets us think about others' needs is important, too. By itself, any new technology is just a new silo. 
just a new way of creating exclusivity, just a new way of saying only my needs and desires matter, just a new way of saying in five years' time, this is the process that binds you. And we can be better than that. So technology cannot save us, at least not by itself, or not by ourselves. And I would love to, at this point, at the end of my talks, give you magical guidance for, to take back to your companies, magical solutions to all of your problems. And I wish I could, but I can't, because magical solutions don't exist. But what you can do is, as I've said, you can go out and listen, listen to needs and goals and desires. Listen, and in so listening, hear what you need to, when you're excited about that new technology or really wanting that change to be made, hear what you need to make adoption a reality. By working together, by understanding each other's needs and goals and context, we can initiate that change. We can make that difference. We can make, we can, we can make it work. I will not take questions. I agree with your premise and disagree with you with the way you got there. Technology requires infrastructures. Infrastructure is technology. Yep. And it's built on a stack. Yes. Going back to Newton, standing on the shoulders of giants and seeing further, et cetera. Yes. If we have that works for anyone, we've got people working in the fields, working in the southern ocean, mm -hmm. we can go to new technologies and they will not work. So, so some of the reasons for not using the technologies can actually be real rather than cultural. Well, I mean, you've, you've captured my same point, though, because the li listening was not gone out and done. We do not fully understand the context, and therefore we will do this thing that is inappropriate. Um, that is exactly what I'm hearing. It is that we don't listen, therefore we will. Yes. Um, yes. So technology is not the solution, and, and you can't excuse it solving technology. I because basically just said that for the last half hour. <laughs> Yeah. Not because of the cultural resistance. But that's the context. That is context, yeah. And cultural resistance is one, con one contextual pressure, yes. Insufficient infrastructure is another, but once that's there, you're still bound by those choices. Yes. Hi, Grant. I didn't say it can never change. I can say I said it will never not be there, which is different. Well, I mean, look at look at Unix, right? Unix as six no, how long is Unix? Late seventies, fifty years. Fifty years of Unix exists as a reaction to Multics. That legacy will never go away. The file system as you know it is a reaction to Multics. It's Unix enough. <laughs> and that's a, that is itself a reaction to other cultural constraints. Uh, these, that, that process will never not exist now because the thing that ex reacted to it is there encoding itself as a reaction to the thing. Okay. Yes. Context matters, yes. Uh, and a lot of what you were saying was uh, an awful lot of technology don't change. An awful lot of structures we're building don't have. Technology doesn't. What's it, what are the cultural constraints that let you do that? 
that let you go down that rabbit hole of, I'm going to be able to write tests. That's where the change started happening. And there are organizations that exist that can't do that, that test-driven development isn't permitted or acceptable or doesn't fit in with the QA cycle or all, all of these things. Um, so yes, it gives us these freedoms, but it is a new technology, a new practice, which is potentially contextually inapplicable. And that's what I'm trying to get at is, this is a cool thing that I do all the time. Like I love tests, I love test driven development. Why can't I use it in some places? That's the question. Why can you use it? But I, hypothetically, I'll just wave at you, you can't. Daniel cannot use test driven development. Why not? Why can you? That's the question. It's not, that is not it. It is, it is not a, an intelligence factor. It is a cultural context and cultural constraints question. What defines what we're allowed? I think that's just rude. <laughs> I'm going to call that out as rude. I'm not allowed to call people Luddites. Daniel's a really nice guy. He doesn't like teaching teeny boys or anything. It's really nice. Uh, really, I want to focus on it's not the personal, it is the systemic. Yeah. It is all about the systems that influence what we are permitted to do um, and how the system operates. So I do want to keep it at that higher level. Uh, even though it's easy to look at individuals and, and try to find individualized fault or individual problems that we should be looking at. It's, uh, is that a change in culture? It is a change in culture. And those that don't have, are bound by something and understanding if you want to make a change happen, understanding why they're bound. But if you're seeing that happen, yes, that people when presented with small changes. I like the metaphor of a river. Culture is a river, your practice is a river. You cannot dam the river, I mean you can, but it will get lots of resentment and pressure and it will either go around or through. But what you can do is you can take rocks and slowly divert the river. Give it time to carve a new channel. And that's what I'm hearing. Um, I guess um, there's also a possibility that the technology that we're really excited about, it's not just that, it's not that there's things that are restricting us or you know, people just can't really want to copy culture and want to allow us. It's that actually, from our point of view, it's great, but from the rest of the world, it's actually not great. Mm -hmm. Very much so. It's um, what is your context and why does your context say something is good? Um, and this actually could be a really good springboard for a contempt culture uh, conversation. Um, any, have all, any of you heard of contempt culture before? A couple, okay, cool. Um, so contempt culture for the rest of you is this idea that we build um, social cliques within technology based on expressions of contempt towards things outside of our clique. So you would see this most prominently as if you're a PHP user, you get the, the, the sharp end of that. Um, or a JavaScript user, or a Java user, like pick a technology, that is contempt culture in action. These people are being ostracized on the grounds of one minor choice in what they do. So what you're ending up with then is a click that is telling you what is and is not acceptable and okay, and that's a self-reinforcing thing. Um, I have multiple computers, I mean. I'm at like five or six now. It's 2018, if you're not using Windows then users also get this. Windows users got this. Like um, one of the, another one of my talks I give talks about the number of things that Windows users have to put up with when they try to go, start going down the free software interest path. If you, thank you. Um, the amount of things they have to go through to try to use free software tooling because of how much raw contempt has been written into the tools themselves um, and hostility towards Windows users. Was the, there is no on-ramp to free software for Windows users. There is, here's some walls and a whole bunch of us spitting at you. Um, and that's what I mean is within this, this click that you're in, a technology will sound and look and feel great, but that stops at the border. That's exactly what you're saying. Okay. 
Ausgleich in der Atmosphäre der Palästinensgruppe zu aber für Ausbildung von Leuten, die nicht hier sind. Noch etwas in keinem Atmosphäre. Sie sind jetzt über selber so, ja, aber ich schwinge die. It's it's not the individuals, it's the system. The person who said that was the best two hours has been primed by a system that says that this is how you should think. Uh, if you're in free software, you are primed by a free software culture to think that free software is good. I spent the last two decades working in the same organization with and virtually side by side doing very similar work in the same place. That's almost totally a personality difference. It, I, I, I really, person, really want to stay away. I, know, I really do want to stay away from individuals or individual reactions. I really do want to focus on the systemic effect of, uh, and the like, statistically observable if, if results you're, that if we can see. The concept with you is resistance. The people resisting you are individuals, not an organization necessarily. It, you need to address them as individuals to communicate to them the ideas you have to, to make them comfortable. You can communicate with individuals, but you're communicating with individuals within a, con within a systemic consistency. Concept. So you're communicate. You're finding individual communication styles within that system to manipulate the system and how they behave within the system. You're not. In, you're not manipulating individuals. You're changing a culture, a system. Cool. Thank you.